Welcome everyone to this week's Torah portion, and this week is called Shaftim. Now, I just love the Lord's sense of humor because there's a few Torah portions this year that somehow I ended up teaching again. <laughs> last year, I did Shaftim, and I want to encourage you to go back to last year's teaching because last year we focused on what does it mean not to judge? We look at that part where we see the Lord saying, don't judge, for you will be judged. And we talk about final judgment and discernment and the difference between the two. And today we're going to look at a whole different way of judging, how we can apply this. And this is what I love about the word of God is that there's so many ways to apply it. There's so much depth to the word of God. Um, you know, we've got the, the, the very thing that the word means. And then we delve deeper into the deeper levels. And it's just amazing how we can apply it to different areas of our lives. So Shof team is in Deuteronomy 16, verse 18 to 21, verse 9. And then the Haftorah portion that goes with this is Isaiah 51, verse 12, Jaziah 50, 52, verse 12. And then there are many uh, New Testament portions, but the one that I chose that goes with this is Matthew 5, verse 38 to 42. Now, I chose this picture today for a reason, because earlier this week, we celebrated the new moon, the beginning of the month of Elu. And like uh, Marita said, now it is the time of the king being in the field. And so this is also a time of repentance. But what they find is that the, the phrase in Song of Solomon's, that famous phrase, I am my beloved's and my beloved's is mine. If they look at it in the Hebrew, the first letters of each word spells the, the word Elul. So this time of repentance, yes, we need to understand that God is our judge and we will stand before him. And this is his final grace period where we can repent. But this is also a time of intimacy, of coming into intimacy with our beloved. So remember, whenever we speak about keeping the commandments, it should never be out of a soulish place, never out of our flesh, always from a place of I love you, Lord. And because I love you, I keep your commandments. Okay, so let's start. Today, we're going to focus on what does it mean to appoint judges and officers. We're going to talk about gates. We're going to talk about two or three witnesses and how that fits in with the prophecy of Messiah. And we're going to speak about fear and procrastination. So let's talk about the judges. We find our portion starts in Deuteronomy 16 verse 18 by saying you are to appoint judges and officers for all your gates. I don't know your God is giving you tribe by tribe and they are to judge the people with righteous judgment. And there's only one righteous judgment and that's according to the word and the commandments of God. So let's talk a little bit about what a judge is. Like I said, last year we focused on how we are not supposed to be a final judge, but God still calls us to have discernment. But today I want to talk more personal. As we are going into this month of Elul, and it's a time of personal repentance, what does it mean for us? Why is this Torah portion in this time of the year? of the Jewish calendar. So first I want to look at what does the word judge mean? And it in Hebrew it's shafat. And it means to judge, to pronounce judgment for or against. So judgment isn't always bad. You know, I always say God's judgment is bad for those that are not in covenant with him, but it's a blessing for those that are in the covenant. It's to vindicate or to punish. It's to govern, to defend to execute, and to reason or to plead. So I really want to focus on to govern, to defend, and to reason or to plead. And you'll see now how this fits into our teaching for today. Because you see, a judge also presents our soul dimension. When we start to study the word of God and we grow in knowledge, um, that is in our soul that we have reasoning, we, we have logic, we see the evidence of the word of God, we see God saying, if you do this, this is the blessing, if you don't do it, 
this is the curse. Um, we make an assessment, we study, and all of that happens in our soul. And the soul part of us that judges is what decides where to direct our energy, our focus, and our resources. And this judge part of the soul sometimes wants to go on leave. <laughs> so sometimes we think, you know, oh, I'm so tired of always just keeping up and making sure that I'm inside God's will. And sometimes we, you know, life and stress and trauma and even the enemy just wears down the judge part of our soul and we lose good judgment. And that is why it's important that God says, don't just employ judges at your gates. And I'm talking now personal, okay? but also employ officers because what happens is, I don't know who's ever been in a court a hearing and know how it works, but the judge sits there and his word is the final word. But we can have judges all day making righteous judgments. If we don't have an officer that is enforcing what the judge is saying, it really doesn't help. And that's the same with us. Sometimes we know the truth. And we study the word and with logic and reasoning and everything, we know exactly what the right thing is to do. But sometimes our judge just needs a little bit of help. And that is where the officer comes in. And that's the officer of the court. I thought this picture was quite amusing, but also very um, indicative of what we sometimes need. You know, sometimes that is us. <laughs> we need a bit of force to take us in the right direction. So let's look at what an officer is. An officer is an official. It's a superintendent. It's an officer. It's an overseer and it's a ruler. So I want to focus on the overseer and the ruler because the officer is really our will. So we don't just need to have the judge part. That's our soul where we study the word of God and we reason and we learn and we know, but we also need the officer, we need to employ our will to actually do what the judge knows the right thing is to do. You cannot enforce law with just a judge. The officer is the enforcer. And the officer has got nothing to do with the soul. So the officer doesn't have anything to do with thinking and reasoning and all of those things that the judge part of the soul is over. The officer simply does what the judge says and so we we have this officer that then deals with the challenges the obstacles the things that actually make us not want to do what we know the right thing is to do and how do you force yourself to do what you know is right um you know and that is by employing this will part so for you to keep on doing what the right thing is to do is to basically submit your will to the will of God. Your will becomes the officer that enforces the law that the judge part, your soul, learns while studying Torah. And so we need to really pray to God that our will will be aligned with his will and pray that we submit our will to his will and Yeshua was such an amazing example because he prayed and he said not my will but your will be done and that was really a key for me so in this week's Torah portion that's what I got out of this is I need to make sure that I don't just have the judge part that's working and studying and learning the word of God and, you know, making sense out of it. And some of it doesn't make sense, but it's, a, it's okay because I know it's in the word of God. I need to also have my will. When my will and my judge work together, that's where the protection lies in the gates of my body and my soul and my spirit. So today I want to talk about the gates of the body. We could go into hours and hours of teaching because our spirits and our souls also have gates, but it all starts with our physical gates. Remember, God created us body, soul, and spirit. And so because we are a body living in a physical world, um, we are a spirit with a physical body, excuse me, but our body is the first thing that we experience things with. We are not yet just living in a spirit realm 
just having a spirit body. So our body is the first place of contact. That's the first place where things enter. And what either enters through our body's gates eventually goes down into our soul and affects our spirit man. So in ancient times, the gate of the cities were very important. And this picture really speaks a thousand words. You can see there's no way you're going to get into the city unless you go through the gate. And so in ancient times, they made really sure that those gates were guarded very well, that they were reinforced and they had um, these iron bars that they would put in and extra doors and they would have watchmen on the gates. So they really did everything they could to ensure that whatever goes in and out of that city is going through that gate and whatever should not be going in stays outside. And that was the protection. That was the life of the city. And so what's interesting is that the, the judges also sat at the gates. So where important decisions were made and where important deals were struck was at the gates of the city. And it's still that way with you and I. I don't think we think of it that way. But we're going to look a little bit later at our gates. And our gates are our ears and our eyes and our mouth and if we could just employ the same form of security um, that we see these ancient cities have with their gates, if we could understand the importance of our gates, and if we could really guard what goes in and out of our gates, I believe our lives would be so much different. So the judges sat at the gates. So now your judge, remember we said, is the part of your soul that knows the truth of the word of God, that, that studies the commandments. And this judge, we should be constantly aware of everything that we're seeing, hearing, and speaking, and it should be filtered through the judge saying, does this line up with the word of God? Is this holy? Is this true? You know, in the times we live in, it's very difficult. Uh, we've lost a sense of what is holy and what is profane. And it's so easy for us to mix the two. And I really pray that even during this month of Elul, that the Holy Spirit will help us again, heighten our discernment to know what is profane and to not allow the profane back into us through our eyes, our ears, and our mouths. So the judges would sit there and they would ask. They wouldn't just let you in, especially if you're not a citizen of the city and you were just traveling and you wanted to enter. You couldn't just enter the city. You had to report to the judges and they would ask you, what is your business in this city? And that is what we need to ask ourselves with the things that we watch and listen to and and um you know, expose ourselves to and our children to. What is your business here? What do you want to do in me? If I allow you in, what is going to happen? Will it bring forth life or will it bring forth death? But also, interesting, those that wanted to leave, they also had to report to the judges. You didn't just leave. You had to tell them, where are you going? What are you going to do? When are you going to be back? And that really speaks to our mouth gate. Because, you know, our mouths can be very loose. And it's very easy for us to just let things out of our mouths. And what did Jesus say? What did Yeshua say? He said the issue is not about washing your hands before you eat. Um, because dirty hands won't defile your food and make you dirty on the inside. Now, I just want to say, it is good hygienic practice to please wash your hands before you eat because <laughs> you don't want to get any germs in your body. But he was speaking about something deeper. He was speaking to a spiritual issue. And what he was saying is that the words that come out of your mouth defile your whole body. So what comes out of your mouth defiles the entire city. And that's why it's also important for whatever wants to leave through the gate of the city to report to the judge sitting at the city gate. 
And like I said, important decisions were made there. And we face important decisions every day. We face that decision. Will I spend this time watching this TV show or lying on Facebook or reading this book or this magazine? And please hear my heart. I'm not saying you must sit in Bible study 24-7. All I'm saying is that the content of most of the entertainment entertainment that we have is so ungodly. It's so defiling. And if that's an important decision that you make every day about what goes into your gates because it will become part of who you are. And a great example of important decisions made at the gate is Boaz and Ruth. We see he's the kingsman redeemer no, and the closest kingsman redeemer to Ruth does not want to redeem her. He doesn't see the value in doing that. And so Boaz says, but I'll, I'll redeem her. And he goes to the city gate and there's that whole thing with the sandal and the judges. And that's how he redeems her. And even that is a picture of this time of the king in the field. Because where did Ruth and Boaz meet. They met in the field. Where was Ruth? She was busy in the field, in the king's field. And that's where he saw her. And he saw she was a woman of character. And he fell in love with her and he wanted to redeem her. So even that points us back to the time that we're in. But I wanted to use that as an example of this important decision that took place at the gate. And I want to challenge you, if we are saying that we are the bride of Messiah, and we see this picture of Boaz and Ruth, and how their union was basically decided and sealed at this gate, does that not tell us how important what we let in and out of our gates are if we want to be the Messiah's bride? So I'll just leave you to think about that. Let's talk about the gates. The first gate is our ear gate. And what, whose voice are you intimate with? You know, we've got spiritual ears and we've got physical ears. And so often Satan attacks us with negative thoughts about ourselves, about our circumstances, our identity, how we see ourselves, how we think other people see us. He is the father of lies. He lies to us. And we become so intimate with the voice of the father of lies through our spiritual ears and through the ears of our mind. So I also want to really challenge you to pray, Lord, where I have been out of tune. It's kind of like a radio with an antenna and you're on the wrong frequency. You're picking up the wrong channel. Lord, fix that. Uh, tune me into your spirit, to your word. I want to be intimate with what you say about me, the truth of who you made me to be. So firstly, our ears show us Whose voice are we listening to? Whose voice are we intimate with? Then we spoke about it. What are you listening to? Goodness, I've totally stopped listening to secular music uh, a few years ago already. And every now and then when I'm in the car and the radio is on or someone's radio is on, I am shocked by the words, the lyrics that we listen to. So, you know, that is defiling. We need to put up a guard, a judge, an officer to keep that out. The movies, the TV, social media, there is very little that is godly. And, and many of the things that they sugarcoat as being godly is not godly at all. It just does not line up with the word of God. What conversations do you entertain? You know, I've been at, at, at people's houses where they've invited us for dinner and where we've been exposed to conversations that afterwards I'll say to my husband, sure, I feel like I want to take a shower. <laughs> this was horrific. And, you know, I, I don't build relationships like that. I love them and I'll pray for them, but my time is precious and I don't want to spend my time listening to other people's um, dodgy jokes, conversations that are not good, um, swear words, Stuff like that, you know, don't entertain that. It defiles your spirit and your soul. And then lastly, gossip and slander. You know, um, don't lend out your ears to those kind of things. These are just a few examples of your ear gates and how you need to judge before you just let something in. Acts 7 verse 51 says, You stiff-necked and stubborn people, 
uncircumcised in heart and ears. You are always actively resisting the Holy Spirit. You are doing just as your fathers did. And may the Lord help us and forgive us because we've all been there. You know, I've had times in my life where I've known the Lord is telling me not to do this or the Lord is telling me to cut a friendship or to to, to move on to something else. We, I, I heard the Lord tell me something or I know this is a commandment and then I wouldn't keep it. And I went through a lot of um, difficult times because of my rebellion, because of being stiff-necked, because I was resisting the Holy Spirit. And so the Lord's really trained me to be so sensitive, to be sensitive to his spirit and to not resist his spirit. If his spirit tells me to do something, warns me about something, or there's a commandment that I know I'm struggling with, I will really pray and ask the Lord, help me, but I don't want to be disobedient. I don't want to be in rebellion. Lord, circumcise my ears, circumcise my heart. I want to hear your voice and I want to be obedient. That makes me think of the Shema. You know, a few years ago, I started reciting the Shema every morning when I do Bible study. It's so powerful because you're training yourself. How do you teach someone? How does a, a teacher teach a child at school or a um, a, a lecture at the university teach some and you teach by repeating how do you learn by repeating the word and becoming intimate with it and so by repeating the shema every day you are teaching your body soul and spirit you say hear O israel the lord our god the lord is one and, and you are training yourself to listen to the spirit of god Isaiah 53 verse 3 says, incline your ear to listen and come to me, hear so that your soul may live, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you according to the faithful mercies shown to David. There's life in hearing. If we don't listen to God, if we don't have that judge at the gate that makes a ruling and the officer that enforces it, because sometimes you know I shouldn't be watching this or I shouldn't be listening to this. You know it, the judge is there, but the will, the officer is gone. He's on leave or a tea break. And so although you judge correctly, you don't enforce the judgment and you still allow death in. But God says, listen to me and your soul will live. Day two is our eyes. Again, entertainment, games, we all have phones or xboxes or whatever what games are you playing is it godly what are you allowing in is it violent is it cruel does it go against the commandment to love your god with all your heart with all your soul with all your might and to love your neighbor as yourself are you looking at other people with lust with envy with jealousy with comparison what are you reading and what are you focused on? Because remember, you become what you behold. And this focus is not always a physical focus. Sometimes we're so focused on success. Or we're so focused on creating a life that looks successful to the world. Or focused on making money. Or focused on finding a husband or a wife. Or focused on all of these things. And we're not focused on God and on his word. And so what are your physical eyes lustfully or enviously looking at but also what are your spiritual eyes focused on keep your eyes on the lord matthew 6 verse 26 verse 23 says but if your eye is bad your whole body will be full of darkness if then the light in you is darkness how great is the darkness and this made me think of the wicked lamp you know if we look at what it says in the word of God, God absolutely hates these seven things. It starts off with haughty eyes. That's where it starts. It starts off with what we see. If we think of Eve, what was the problem in the garden? She saw that the fruit looked good for eating. It starts with the eyes. And then what she listened to the serpent. And then she ate it with her mouth. 
we, there was a lot of issues with Eve's judges and officers at her gate. In fact, her husband was supposed to be the officer and the judge protecting her. That's why the word says Eve was deceived, but Adam sinned. So even um, we can extend this to parents. You are the judges and the officers of your children's gates. Husbands, you are the judges and the officers of your wife's gates and of the, the household. What are you allowing the people that you are over to look at, to listen to, to speak about? John 2 verse 16 says, For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. Revelation 3 verse 18 says, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by, by fire so that you may be rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and that shame of your nakedness may not be seen and soft to anoint your eyes, eyes so that you may see. So I often pray this. I'll say, Lord, and I buy from you that soft. Anoint my oil, uh, eyes. Take away any spiritual blindness that is leading me into deception. The third gate is our mouth gate. And that's the conversations you're having. What kind of jokes are you telling? What language do you use when you get angry or upset? That's interesting. <laughs> we can be very godly. And sometimes I still struggle with this. Most often I'm okay. But every now and then I'm like, oh, Lord, please forgive me. So, you know, it's easy. God allows those pressure situations to come out to see what comes out of you. Words of hate, name calling, racism, judgment, accusation, doubt, negative words. Are you speaking death? You know, sometimes I hear people say the most horrific things about their own life. I hear people say, oh, I don't want to grow old. I don't want to get older than 40 or, you know, oh, my life is such a mess. I'll never get anywhere. That person is such a disaster. He's a loser. He'll amount to nothing. What are we speaking? God says he created us in his image. He's the creator God that spoke matter into being. And we speak words left, right and center without a moment's um, hesitation, without passing it by the judge. That is the Torah and saying, Lord, is this in line with your word? And so we should be speaking his word. We should be encouraging, praising and worshiping. James 3 verse 10 says, out of the same mouth come both blessing and cursing. These things, my brother, should not be this way. For we have a moral obligation to speak in a manner that reflects our fear of God and profound respect for his precepts. I've been hammering on this for a few weeks now, but that's what the Lord's really working in my life with right now. And that's the lack of the fear and respect that people in general have for God and for the word of God. Proverbs 21 verse 23 says, He who guards his mouth and his tongue guards himself from trouble. You know, they say we've got two ears and one mouth for a reason. <laughs> we should listen twice as much as what we speak. Psalm 19 verse 14, Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable and pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. I love this. This has always been a beautiful song for me. You know, it's not just about our words. Our words come from somewhere. They come from inside and our words come from our heart. And our heart is the emotional seat of our being. And it's from our heart where we think, where we feel. And so we can see what is in a person's heart when we look at what actually comes out of their mouths. May we pray in this season of repentance, Lord, let everything that comes out of me be pleasing to you and bring honor to you. So I want to talk a little bit about Moses and Messiah. And it fits in so beautifully with, with this topic that we've been discussing because Moses is known as the one through which God gave his law and his commandments. Moses was a judge. 
And we see that Messiah is also a judge. And so this whole thing just fits in perfectly with what we spoke about now, about judging ourselves, protecting our gates. And let's look at Deuteronomy 18, verse 15 to 19. I don't know, I will raise up for you a prophet like me from among yourselves, from your own kinsmen. You are to pay attention to him. Just as when you were assembled at Horeb and requested Adonai your God, don't let me hear the voice of Adonai my God anymore, or let me see this great fire ever again. If I do, I will die. On that occasion, Adonai said to me, they are right in what they are saying. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their kinsmen. I will put my words in his mouth. And he will tell them everything I order him. Whoever doesn't listen to my words, which he will speak in my name, will have to account for himself to me. Firstly, I want to address the issue that um, we have because of this terrible false doctrine that there is an old covenant and a new covenant. Because God himself prophesies that he's going to send someone just like Moses. In fact, he says it twice in this portion, and when God repeats something, he's definitely putting emphasis on it. There is no difference between Moses and Messiah. Both of them teach us the commandments of God and teach us to keep them out of love. So Messiah is a prophet just like Moses. The difference is Messiah was revealed to Moses as the law of God, and Moses wrote down Messiah for us. But then Messiah came to walk amongst us to show us how to live. And this section in the middle where, where God came down on the mountain and the people were, af were afraid, um, I want to refer you back to a slide that I had a few weeks ago about the fear of the Lord and the wisdom of God and the spirit of God where we looked at the menorah. And I explained to you that if we just live on the side of the fear of the Lord, then everything is very legalistic um, and scary and there's no relationship. But if we just live on the side of the grace, the lamb that was slain, and, you know, all is mercy and grace, then there's no fear and there's no respect. But when we live from the middle of the menorah, where God's spirit is, and out of that spirit flows all of these other attributes, and we are in perfect balance between a healthy dose of fear of God and an understanding that God is also grace then we are truly living our Torah the way God wanted us to do it. So what happened at this mountain is that they were exposed to this side that was just the fear. The fear was so bad that they thought, we're going to die. We can't face this. And so God says, okay, so I've shared my word from this place of terrible fear so that you need to understand that I am all powerful and you will have respect for me and you should fear me. But you know what? I'm going to send my grace son. I'm going to send my son. He's going to come down to earth, a humble man, nothing special about him. He's going to serve. He's going to love. He's going to lay down his life. He's going to be the mercy son. So then you're going to hear my word from the mercy son and you'll have heard my word from the fear side. And I want you to put the two together and understand that although I expect your fear and your reverence and your respect, I also want you to understand that I'm a God of mercy and grace and I love you. And this is the prophecy that we see in this, this portion that we read this week. And God says, I'm going to put my words in his mouth and you need to do everything that he tells you to do. And we see Yeshua saying that when he was on earth. I don't say anything unless the Father tells me to say it. I don't do anything unless the Father tells me to do it. What an excellent example. May we all strive to be like our Messiah. But then we also see a warning. God says, you didn't want the fear side, but you better remember that you will account to me. So if you don't listen to the mercy side and you reject that as well, if you reject the words that he will speak to you, you will account to me for rejecting my son. 
Hebrews 10 verse 26 to 30 says, For if we go on sinning deliberately, after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has outraged the spirit of grace? For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, and again the Lord will judge his people. And I believe this part of Hebrews refers back to this week's Torah portion because this week's Torah portion also speaks of that you will not uh, judge unless there is witness from two or three people. And it prophesies about the sun coming. It prophesies about the spirit of grace. And then it also says that if you do not listen, so if you continue to sin deliberately, there will be judgment. And remember, what is the definition of sin? The definition of sin is a rejection of Torah. So if we reject Torah, we are rejecting the Messiah. We are profaning the sacrifice of his blood. And we are rejecting Moses. So I want to move on from judgment and guarding and the judges and the officers and I want to finish off with something that's always fascinated me about this Torah portion we find that God speaks to them and he says when you go to war so I want to stop there quickly a lot of people think when you get saved there's no more war then it's just glory hallelujah I sit in peace and wait for Jesus to come and take me home. And unfortunately, that is not what the word of God says. The word of God says we will prepare ourselves for war. There will be war. And we see in the story portion, God says, when you go to war, don't be afraid. I'm going with you. The covenant is going with you. You've got the covenant promises that are protecting you. But then we see that there are certain things that disqualify certain people from going to war. And, you know, a few years ago when I read this, I thought, wow, this is really nice. You know, it's so nice of the Lord to think of these people. And we're going to look at them now and say, you know what, shame, you don't have to go to war because you still haven't lived in your house and you haven't eating the fruit from your vineyard that you've planted and you haven't married yet. I thought that's really nice. They should actually do that for all people. <laughs> but then as I studied this further and as I grew um, in, in my study of the word of God and understanding, I realized, yes, that is a very good principle, but there's something deeper here that God is trying to teach us. So it says in Deuteronomy 20 verse 5, Then the officers shall speak to, let the, to the people, saying, Is there any man who has built a new house and has not dedicated it? Let him go back to his house, lest he die in battle, and another man dedicate it. And is there any man who has planted a vineyard and has not enjoyed its fruit? Let him go back to his house, lest he die in the battle, and another man enjoy its fruit. And is there any man who has betrothed a wife and has not taken her? Let him go back to his house, lest he die in the battle and another man take her. And the officers shall speak further to the people and say, Is there any man who is fearful and faint-hearted? Let him go back to his house, lest he make the heart of his fellows melt like his own. Now that one made a lot of sense. You don't want to go to war with someone that's scared. Okay, but then do you know that uh, three of these things actually show procrastination? So if you have built a house, why haven't you moved into it yet? Why haven't you dedicated it? I mean, let, think about it. If you build a new house, aren't you so excited? Don't you just want to get in, dedicate it and live in it? Why has this person built it and not finished dedicating it and moving in? Why would you plant a vineyard and not harvest it yet? Why would you get betrothed? I don't know, those of you that have been engaged, those of you that have been in love, 
you know, it's like you just cannot wait for that wedding day. You can't wait. You you do everything just to get married as soon as possible because you want to live together and you want to consecrate your marriage. And so what the rabbis actually say is that these types of people, these scenarios show us people that don't have grit. They don't have self-discipline. They have done something, but they don't have the discipline to finish it, to bring it to fruition. And that is why they're not allowed to go to war. And often it's because of fear. That final guy that they said, if you to scared, don't go. That's the problem that all of these people have. They have these amazing things, this newly built house, this vineyard, this woman that they need to marry. But for some reason, fear is causing them to go into passivity. And God does not want people that are passive, that know that there is work to be done. There is something that needs to be completed and finished. He doesn't want those people to go to battle with him. What else is signified by a house, a vineyard, and an engagement? Because this goes deeper. This goes deeper than someone that's passive and, and you know, just not being productive. It actually speaks to the covenant in your wife. So this speaks to every man, every husband, every father that is not taking up their role as a priest and a king of their house because you are procrastinating, because you are in fear, you are not taking up your authority. Because if we look in the Bible, a vineyard speaks of your wife. It's your marriage. Engagement is to a wife. It's a marriage. And a house is only a house once you have a husband and a wife that comes together. So God is saying, if your affairs are not in order, if you are procrastinating, if you are passive, if there are things that you need to do that you're not doing, and if you're not taking up your identity and your role in your house and in your marriage, then you cannot go to war. Joel 3 verse 9 to 11 says, Proclaim this morning to the nations. Prepare for war. Wake up the mighty men. Let all the men of war draw near. Let them come up. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I am strong. Assemble and come, all you nations, and gather together all around. Cause your mighty ones to go down there, O Lord. So I don't know if you're aware that we are in a time where we are going into the final battle. And you need to take stock of your life of your relationships, of your marriage, of things that God have told you to sort out and to deal with and to finish that you are procrastinating, that you are passive in. Because when this war comes, I promise you, you want to be in God's army and you want to be ready for war. Points to ponder. Have you appointed judges and officers at your gates? What is entering and exiting from your gates? And is it bringing glory to God? And are there areas of your life that you need to work on, but out of fear, you are procrastinating? Shabbat Shalom.